I feel like the Hunger Games is having a bit of a renaissance and I was never really a Hunger Games girly. Like when it was really popular, I was kind of young and I was also really scared of stuff. So I kind of just stayed away from the Hunger Games because I knew that shit was dark. And I'm kind of surprised that a lot of young kids really like jumped onto the Hunger Games because it is brutal. I feel like it's a series that you can really only appreciate when you're older, but I mean, sure, might as well start them young. So I reread the Hunger Games book recently for the first time since maybe middle school and god damn it was so good i kept thinking like every twist and turn every decision that the author made i was like yeah mm -hmm, that was the best choice and let me just say also i didn't think Peta would be my type i've seen people simping for him recently and i was just like I don't know. I don't know if the bread boy would be my type, but he is. He, I cannot stress to you enough how impeccable of a specimen that is PETA. Like, the kindest soul ever. He can bake, do frosting decor. He is also sassy and flirty and smart. <laughs> So that is why we will be doing The Hunger Games from PETA's perspective. Also, someone wrote a fan fiction of The Hunger Games from PETA's perspective. Igzy Grace, you're amazing. I'll link it down below. It is so much more well-written, well-executed, longer, has more embellishments. It's just overall a really good read. If you'd like to stick around for a trashier, shorter, silly, goofy version with a few motherfuckers thrown in there, you're in the right place. Without further ado, let's get into The Hunger Games from PETA's perspective. Hi, y'all. My name is Pita, like the bread. Speaking of bread, I'm somewhat of a baker myself. My father is a baker and we live in the town of District 12, which is slightly classier than another part of the district, the seam, which is close to the mines. I have two other brothers and a mother as well. My brothers and I wrestle and compete with each other, but other than that, we're not too involved in each other's personal lives. And what more is there than going to school and baking bread for this happy family? I'm not really exactly sure why my father married my mother because their personalities don't really seem to mesh well together. My father is kind-hearted and goes with the flow while my mother is unforgiving and strict and blunt. Actually, I know for a fact that my mother wasn't my father's first choice because on the first day of school when I was five years old, my father pointed out a little girl in a red plaid dress with two braids and said, I wanted to marry her mother, but she ran off with a coal miner. I thought, why would she want to marry a coal miner if she could have ended up with my dad? My dad said it's because when he sings, even the birds stop to listen. That day in music assembly, the teacher asked who knew the valley song and the girl with the braids raised her hand. When she started, I I swear every bird outside the windows fell silent and from that moment on I knew I was a goner. Then for the next 11 years I tried to work up the courage to talk to her. Without success, I may add. For a while I knew she had no idea that I existed but that just meant I could look at her longer without feeling like a stalker. Her name is Katniss and her father died in a coal mining accident that affected a lot of the district leaving her with a mother and a younger sister. Before her father died he would supply us with squirrels and a lot of the town had a good opinion of him which translated to Katniss when she took over the hunting and providing for her family. My father said she's really talented with a bow and can shoot animals directly in the eye. And that must have been really hard on her, having to provide for her family at such a young age. To hunt, she would have needed to go into the woods, which surrounds our district. There's an electric fence that's supposed to keep these wild animals out of like these mutt mutation things that are kind of like werewolves that the government created during the dark days. But our electricity is super spotty, so she must be able to slip through. Things must have been worse than anyone realized because one day, my mother caught her rummaging around in our trash for scraps. I purposefully burnt two loaves, which caused my mother to hit me, and I went out outside into the rain to throw the burnt bits to the pigs when I saw her crying under a tree. I threw the rest of the two loaves to her and then went back inside before my mother could figure out what happened. That was our only direct interaction and we didn't even speak with each other, but from then on, whenever I would be looking at her, sometimes I would catch her staring back at me. But I couldn't quite decipher the look in her eyes. Is she offended by what I did that day? She hasn't tried to approach me and I haven't tried to approach her. That's why at the age of 16 on the day of the reaping, I almost couldn't believe when I found myself on stage in the square looking into her gray eyes once again. The society that we live in is pretty fucked up, let me tell you. They have this thing called the Hunger Games where a boy and a girl from each district between the ages of 12 and 18 fight to the death. This is because the capital where all the rich people live were victorious in an uprising during the dark days where a whole entire district was obliterated and now the remaining 12 have to suffer the consequences. It's basically to show that the capital has ultimate control over us. We have no contact with the other districts, but they all specialize in doing different things. District 12 is the worst of them all and we specialize in mining coal. Anyway, so the way in which they pick this boy and girl for the Hunger Games is through a lottery system where your name is entered once at the age of 12, twice at 13, and so on. So the older you get, the higher your chances of getting picked. So my name was entered a total of five times that day. You also have the option to add your name more times in exchange for 
food, but my family didn't need to do that. The mayor, a woman from the capital named Effie Trinket, and the only living victor from District 12, who's actually one of the two victors who have ever won from District 12, Hamish is up on the stage giving the reaping ceremony. There's a huge ball filled with the slips of the names of the boys and then a separate one for the girls. Effie picks the girl name first and it is Primrose Everdeen, AKA Katniss's younger sister. It's always unfortunate when a 12 year old gets picked because odds wise they should be the least likely to be picked because when they go into the games, they're at an extreme disadvantage because of their age. But the fact that it's Prim, I don't know a single person whose heart doesn't melt when they're talking to her. She's the only one to stop by the shop and look at my elaborate frosting designs when no one could even give less of a shit. And I don't think anyone is prepared to watch Prim die in the coming days. I look at her walking up onto the stage when I hear someone call her name over and over again. It's Katniss, she's wearing this flowing blue dress and dare I say she looks exquisite, but that's besides the point. When she says she volunteers as tribute, my heart fucking drops. She then throws herself in front of her sister and then Gail Hawthorne has to pry Prim away from her. A lot of the girls have a crush on him in school and you know what, I, I'm not gonna lie, I see it, but I'm pretty sure him and Katniss are like cousins or something. They look a lot alike and they hang out a lot because they're hunting partners. If not, I'm not surprised he took an interest in Katniss. What's not to like? In fact, at that point, I think the entire district has a respect for Katniss because when she goes up onto the stage and faces us, no one claps. Instead, everyone takes the three middle fingers of their left hand, touches it to their lips, and then points it back at her. It's an old gesture of our district meaning thanks, admiration, and goodbye to someone you love. And I'm gonna have to watch the girl I've admired die from a distance. That's when I hear Effie call out my name. Guess it won't be from a distance then. Of course, I don't expect either of my brothers to do what Katniss did. One of them's too old to enter the games anyway. But I'm so stunned and scared shitless that I almost laugh because in any other circumstance, I would be fucking ecstatic to be face to face with her. Except this is the reaping. Our chances of survival are slim and we're expected to kill even each other. But you know what they say, if two people are in a dangerous situation, they're more likely to fall in love. I'd say the odds are in my favor. So when we reach out to shake each other's hands, I give hers a little squeeze to say that I respect her and this whole thing is fucking weird and ridiculous and I'm rooting for her. Anyway, I hope that came across. Katniss and I are marked to the Justice Building and put into two separate rooms so we could say our final goodbyes to our loved ones. I get to see my family, my mom and my dad and my brothers. Everyone is a sobbing mess, even my mother. But I try to put a silver lining on it. Both of my brothers are now too old to enter the game so they can live in peace until grandkids come along. But seeing their faces stirs something in my heart. I can't truly say that I'm convinced that I could win, but it's not impossible. I'm not gonna go out without a fight. My mom's parting words to me are actually that maybe District 12 will finally have a winner. Wow, this is a first. My mom actually has enough faith in me to win the games. She wouldn't say that unless she really believed it. I start to feel all warm and tingly inside until she says she's a survivor that one. Well, shit. Turns out my mom is convinced I'm gonna perish and is putting all her money on Katniss. Nice. I mean, fair enough, I'm strong, but I don't have any combat skills like Katniss and I am primed to bake bread for a living. Whose fault is that, mother? Before he leaves, my dad hands me a little white package of sugar cookies and I wanna start pissing and crying and throwing up all over again because I don't think I can bear not seeing him again. As I leave to rejoin Katniss, I'm painfully aware that the whole world can see how red and puffy my face is post breakdown. From now on, practically every single second I'm going to be on camera and I know that I have to be aware of how I present myself because that's going to affect how the crowd is going to see me, but at this point I really don't give a shit. I just saw my family probably for the last time give me a goddamn break. Katniss looks way more put together than me. Strong and determined even. That must be how she looks to the world. Unbreakable. And maybe I would think the same if I didn't see her that day in the rain. If I didn't know I would be sent to the slaughterhouse soon, this whole thing would be low-key pleasant. I've never been in a car or a train before. Everything is so fancy and they give me and Katniss this whole big meal where we're able to stuff ourselves. Katniss and I freshen up and she comes out wearing this fancy looking pin on her chest. It must be a goodbye gift or something. Effie makes a comment about how last year's tributes were less civilized than us and so Katniss starts eating with her hands. I would laugh but I'm afraid about puking up all of the food that I just ate. Hamish eventually arrives on the scene, drunk as usual, and he actually slips and falls in his own vomit. And so Katniss and I carry him to his room and I volunteer to clean him up. If the roles were reversed, I'd be uncomfortable in her position, so it's the least I could do. At breakfast the next morning, me and Katniss both seem to be annoyed at the absolute nonchalance of this man, Hamish. And she asks for any advice and he says to stay alive and starts laughing. So I say that's very funny before knocking out the glass in his hand and sending it shattering to the floor. Only not to us, bitch. Then he punches 
punches me in the face. When I look up, I see that Katniss actually wedged a knife between his hand and the next bottle he was about to grab. From then on, something in Hamish changes because he actually starts to take us seriously. He tells me to let the bruise on my face show because that'll get the other competitors talking. Then he asks Katniss if she could actually use the knife and she sends it hurtling across the room and it ends up lodged in the scene between two panels. Damn. Then he makes a deal with us. If we don't interfere with his drinking, he'll stay sober enough to help us. But we have to do exactly as he says. So we both agree because <laughs> what other choice do we have? He says, first of all, don't resist the stylus when we get to the station. That's actually in fact all he says because he immediately leaves after that. And we actually don't see him for a while and Katniss actually asks about strategies regarding the cornucopia, but the man is gone. Then we arrive at the capital and despite my resentment towards it, it is actually beautiful. People start recognizing our train and waving and so I wave back and smile. Sponsors may be my only hope considering I have zero skills. Then I get whisked away to get all glamoured up because we're gonna be presented to the world. My stylist is Portia and she says Katniss is stylist Cinna is giving us complimentary costumes so we can go out with a bang just like Katniss's father. So we're standing on the chariot about to go out and they're like we're going to set you on fire and I was like I excuse me? Me and Katniss were scared we're going to be burned to death and then we're set on fire and I look at her and oh my god. Words can't even describe her beauty. This girl is on fire. Before we go out, Cinna gestures for us to hold hands and so we do and honestly I'm glad he did because that was the only thing keeping me from falling over. Katniss even tried to let go at one point and I was like, no girl, don't let go of me, don't you dare. We really did make a big impression but honestly, it wasn't me. It was all Katniss. The crowd couldn't take their eyes off of her and neither could I to be quite honest. It's the first time I've ever seen her try to be charming and oh boy is it dangerous. She has the whole world wrapped around her finger and it's not even just her beauty. It's how she embodies something bigger. She seems to represent change and determination and sorrow and youth and hope and light all at the same time. When we're done I thank her for keeping hold on me because I was shaking like crazy and she said the crowd didn't notice probably and I'm like yeah girl that's because they were looking at you. So I smile and get this she leans in and kisses me. Oh? I I'm not really sure what this means. We get along well she laughs at my jokes and I'm sure if I didn't take 11 years to talk to her, uh, we would be close by now. She could be playing me into lowering my guard. And if that's the case, she can play me all she wants. So then we're taking to the training center. Hamish finally shows up when me and Katniss are eating dinner with our stylists and Effie. Katniss starts to drink a bit and it didn't even look like the alcohol was affecting her until she opens her mouth. She looks at one of the girls serving us and says she recognizes her and from the looks around the table, I could tell that she was not supposed to say that. Effie informs us that she is an avix, which means she did something traitorous to get her tongue cut out and is now forced to live a life of servitude. Why would Katniss know an Avix? Is she from her district? Cause I don't recognize her. But she's in a little bit of a pickle and Prince Charming's gonna come to her rescue. So I said, oh, you know, she looks like good old Deli. Right Katniss, they could be doppelgangers. Then the whole table relaxes and I'm like, crisis averted. Then Hamish says we should go and get some sleep because tomorrow he's ready to talk strategy about the games. But before Katniss goes into her room, I start to talk to her about the Avix situation because she and I both know that Deli looks nothing like that chick, but she seems hesitant to talk to me. So I suggest going up onto the roof. Cinna brought me up there earlier and there's actually this barrier around the roof to prevent us from jumping off and killing ourselves prematurely because god forbid we die for any other reason than your entertainment. Apparently the Avix girl and a boy were running away from the capital and ended up in the woods outside of district 12 and Katniss and Gail saw them from the trees. A hovercraft came to get them and the boy died but the Avix girl survived. I asked her about Gail because I assumed that they were related but you know I just want to check and it turns out they're not. So that's slightly unfortunate. Then and Katniss says that at the Justice Building, my father was actually one of her visitors, and to be honest, I'm not totally surprised. He seems to have a soft spot for Katniss's mother, and by extension, her daughters. So the next morning, Hamish asks us if we want to be coached separately or together. That's an interesting question. I wonder what she wants to say. If I'm being totally honest with myself, I don't think I could kill her at this point if she asked me to. So what good is there being coached separately for me? I tell him that I don't have any secret tricks, and I've eaten enough of her squirrels to know hers, so she says we can be trained together. He asks me what sort of skills do I have? What can I do? And I say, sir, I can bake bread. He immediately turns to Katniss and says he knows she can use a knife, but what about anything else? And she says she can hunt with a bow and arrow. Then he asks if she's good and she takes a minute and says, yeah, I'm alright, bitch. Every single animal you shoot is straight through the eyeball. She can even take down a deer. I tell him all this and Katniss asks me what I'm doing. I say, girl, he can't help you properly if he doesn't know what you're capable of. Don't underrate yourself. Then she says she sees me lifting 100 pound bags of flour. Why didn't I tell him that? And I say, oh gee, I don't think there'll be any bags of flour for me to toss around in the arena. You know that's nothing compared to being able to handle a weapon. Then she says that I wrestle and I came in second place only after my brother. And at this point I'm thinking, so she was noticing this stuff? Stop. 
I said, have you ever seen someone wrestle someone to death? The thought is straight up horrifying. She says there's always hand-to-hand -hand combat and if she gets jumped, she's dead. And I say, you won't get jumped because you'll be in the trees picking people off. Even my own mother thinks you're gonna win. She says if she does, that's only because someone helped her. I glance at the bread she's holding and I'm thinking, is she referring to that day in the rain? I say, you'll get lots of help in the arena. People will be tripping over themselves to sponsor you. She says the same goes for me and I'm like, <laughs> no, no. Everyone besides her can see that that's not true. Katniss is truly something special. At first I thought my crush on hers would cause me to view her this way, but clearly everyone can see the same thing. When I saw the crowd's reaction to her, and not even just them, the way Cinna and Portia and Hamish all look at her, she needs to win this thing. I want her to win this thing. But wishing that with my whole heart would mean that I need to accept my own death before I even go into the ring. Anyway, Hamish has had enough of our arguing and he says when we go into group training we should try learning something we don't already know and not to show our true skills in front of the other players, but when we're in our private sessions with the game makers, let it rip. He then asks me and Katniss to act like best buddies. And I'm not totally surprised by this. Hamish and Cinna and Portia all seem to have this little touch of rebellion thing going on and it's pretty unconventional for two tributes like us to be shown as like best buddies. People make alliances, sure, but we all know that we're gonna have to kill each other eventually if we wanna win. Katniss apparently really doesn't like that idea because she leaves the table and goes into a room and slams the door. I guess I won't take that personally. So the next morning we go to group training and some of the kids are intimidating, I'll tell you that, like the ones from districts one, two, and four. Katniss and I learn how to make traps, start a fire, use a knife, tie some knots. I excel at the camouflaging station in hand-to-hand -hand combat, meanwhile she sweeps the edible plants test. I know the small girl from District 11 following us around. Her name is Rue, and she low-key reminds me of Prim. As the games are drawing closer and closer, Katniss becomes more and more reserved to the point where she says we should not act like buddies when we're in private, so when we're alone, we just don't talk to each other. It hurts, but I'm not feeling all that talkative as of late myself. Sometimes I feel like I'm betraying my family and even myself by resigning myself to this death, but when I think about it, in my heart, I know that she needs to win. She has everything she needs in order to win. She has a family to go back to. Meanwhile, mine has already accepted my death. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to guarantee her safety. Then it's time for our private sessions with the game makers. Me and Katniss are the last ones to go and she sort of wishes me luck before I head in. I immediately notice that no one is paying attention to me. They're clearly not interested in the District 12 kids at this point. We're the last ones to go. They're probably tired. I throw around a bunch of heavyweights as best I can, but no one even really bats an eye. I'd be lucky if I even get a four when the scores are announced. I go back to meet with Hamish and Effie and wait for Katniss, but when she arrives, she storms past us without a word, goes into our room, and doesn't even come out until dinner. When she does, she looks like she's been crying and doesn't look or speak to any of us. That's not a great sign. I managed to catch her eye once, but she just shakes her head at me. I checked during my time with the game makers, and there was definitely bows and arrows in there. Maybe they were different from the ones she had at home and she did worse than she expected. Or perhaps she's mad for the same reason I was, we were both being straight up ignored. Hamish finally asks how bad it was, and I say, no matter what you did, they probably weren't even paying attention that much. Then she said she shot an arrow at the game makers. She shot the apple out of the roast pig's mouth and left without being dismissed. Holy shit. She's worried about what will happen to her and her family, but Hamish says that the most likely scenario is that they'll make her life a living hell in the arena, which they were already going to do anyway. Then we all start laughing, imagining the ridiculous scene that Katniss describes to us, and then it's time for the scores to be announced. I managed to score an 8, and Katniss gets an 11 out of 12, the highest out of anybody. It's good in a way. People will want to sponsor her since she's promising, but I have an uneasy feeling in my stomach, so when Katniss leaves, I go to talk to Hamish alone. I say I'm okay with the knife, and I can camouflage myself pretty well, but those two things alone are not enough to help Katniss stay alive. He says I should worry about myself. My proximity to her isn't even giving me that much more popularity. But I say I've already decided that I want her to win, and I want to stay alive long enough to keep her alive and for her to win. He looks at me and says we'll discuss this later, and then Katniss comes back for dinner. She asks Hamish about the game plan because we have our first televised interviews tomorrow and he says that I have requested that she and I be coached separately. She looks surprised and maybe even a little hurt, but she doesn't protest. She goes off to work with Effie on her manners and I am left alone with Hamish yet again. He takes a good look at me and then asks me straight up, do you have a thing for Miss Everdeen? And I say, what? <laughs> 
yeah. He says I shouldn't throw my life away over a crush, but I say it's not about that. And I guess something in my face convinces him because he starts talking strategy. He says that my best bet is to get in with the careers at the Cornucopia. There will most likely be a bow there after the stunt that Katniss pulled with the game makers, but if she tries to go for it, she'll be dead before she even reaches it. Then I'll pretend to be allies with them under the guise that I'm leading them to Katniss, but in reality, I'm trying to get the bow to her. The second we meet up, I'll turn on them. But the tricky part is I have to convince the audience, the invisible crowd that's going to be watching us in the arena, that I haven't actually turned on her because that'll be bad for everybody's reputations. I ask if the careers will find it weird that I'm suddenly turning on her after we've been acting as best buddies, but he says the careers know that this whole interview process is just a bunch of garbage. They'll be more interested in my intel on Katniss and learning about her strengths and weaknesses. They know deception is part of the game. She has a target on her back now for her high score and is disliked by the Capitol for the antics she pulled earlier. She seems dangerous and Hamish doesn't really know what to do about that. Suddenly, I get an idea. A kind of crazy, silly, goofy idea. I say the Capitol sees her as dangerous, but what if they see her as just a girl? A girl that I'm in love with. If I confess my feelings to her during the interview, then everyone will see her as part of a tragic love story instead of someone that could cause trouble. He smiles and says that just might work, but we can't tell Katniss because she can't act for shit. At this point, I now realize the gravity of what I had just said. I just kind of said that idea without thinking, but am I ready to actually confess my love to her and to the world at the same time in this interview? I mean, the whole thing just seems insane. It's not like I'm lying about my feelings though, but that just makes it more embarrassing for me. But if it's to keep her safe, it's worth it. He says she'll need a lot of convincing though, but no worries, I can be persistent. We end our session and then I go with Effie to learn some posture and manners and stuff. That night, Katniss doesn't eat dinner with us and when I walk past her room, I can hear the sound of objects shattering. Then it's time for the interview and once again, Katniss is stunning. She goes before me, the crowd loves her, and then at the end she says that she told her sister that she would win and the threat of her words is palpable. Then I'm the very last one to go, which means the entire time I was just sitting there shitting myself thinking about what I need to do. The interview part, that was all fine. I can do that good and well. The confession part, that one I'm not so sure about. The conversation is going well and then like I anticipated, it shifts towards the topic of romance. He asks if I have a girlfriend and I say, Oh. Naturally, he presses for details and I say, well, there's this girl I've had a crush on for a while, but I don't think she noticed me before the reaping. He asks if she's taken and I say, I don't know, but I know a lot of boys like her. He says, I'll just need to go home as a victor and she'll be sure to fall for me. And I say, no, no, I'm not sure it'll work out that way. And he says, why? And I say, well, that's because she came here with me. I take a quick glance at Katniss's face and I could see it's a mixture of shock and confusion and maybe even a little blush. I feel really bad for springing this on her like this. After the interview, me and Katniss take the elevator up in silence and when the doors open to our floor, she pushes me into the urn and I fall out of the elevator. She starts yelling at me about how that made her look weak, but everybody is saying that no, it's actually made her desirable. Meanwhile, my uh, hands are bleeding out onto the floor. I say she's just worried about her boyfriend. She says she doesn't have a boyfriend and I say, well, it's not like you said you loved me, so why does it matter? It hurts though. I mean, I, I don't know what exactly is going on between her and Gail, but I know that the feelings aren't mutual between her and me <laughs> as of right now. I mean, I didn't expect them to be, but damn. I get my hands patched up and we say our final goodbyes to Hamish and Effie. His parting words are to not fuck with the cornucopia and to just find water and stay alive. That's more for Katniss than for me, but she still doesn't know about my plan during the games. Well, she's about to find out. That night, I knew it would be impossible for me to fall asleep. I start thinking about how I'm going to die in the coming days. I don't know how or when, but eventually I will. I think about what my family might be doing in District 12, and if any of them are actually hopeful, I'll come back. I decide to go up onto the roof, and Katniss follows me not long after. I was watching the Capitol people partying and celebrating the games. What a bunch of lunatics. She apologizes again for the damage she did to my hands, but I say it doesn't matter. I was never a contender anyway. I'm sure that when it comes down to it, even I will kill someone too, but I just wish there was a way to show that I was more than just a pawn in the Capitol's game. I want to die as myself and not turn into a monster in there. She says no offense, but but who cares? And I say, well, what else should I be caring about? And she says, staying alive. And I say, thanks for the tips, sweetheart. She says she's gonna make it back to District 12. And I say, well, I fucking hope so. Give my mother my best. Then in the morning, me and Portia make it to this tube where I am lifted from underground and into the arena. All of the tributes are in a ring facing the cornucopia. And for the first time since the rooftop, I see Katniss a few people down from me. I see her looking at something and I follow her gaze to see the bow and arrows that the game makers put in there specifically for her. 
shit. Well, you know, she might just be looking at them, making a mental note, but she won't be stupid enough to run after them. And then I see her get into a crouch and get prepped to run. Shit. If she goes in there and dies, then this whole thing will have been for nothing. We have 60 seconds before the gong strikes and all hell breaks loose, and I don't know how many seconds have passed, but I manage to catch her eye and she looks at me and I shake my head, no. Suddenly the gong strikes and I see her change course heading away from the cornucopia and I breathe a sigh of relief before heading into hell. The careers are brutal, I'll tell you that. They end up taking out 11 people, but I manage to convince them that I'll be able to lead them to Katniss, who's probably one of their biggest priorities. I pick up the bow and arrow. They don't know Katniss can use it, but I need to make sure that they have it just in case we meet up with Katniss later. When asked, I severely undersell Katniss's survival abilities and try to lead them astray. The leader of this group, Kato, makes the strategy to bring all our resources together from the cornucopia and bring them to the lake so that way we have a base where we have food, weapons, and water. We hunt during the night where our priorities are Thresh and Katniss. During one of these hunts, I get my first kill, which was actually finishing off what Kato had already started. It was this poor girl who was already on the brink of death, but that didn't make my job any easier. It's so weird. I'm absolutely repulsed by the actions of Kato, Clove, Glimmer, how they can just kill so easily. And maybe it's not easy for them, but how can I sit here and be disgusted by them when I'm doing the same thing and I need to do the same thing in order for Katniss to win? We also made a plan to reactivate the mine so the boy from District 3 will keep watch while the rest of us go out hunting. The rest has control over the part of the arena with the field and we're not too successful in catching him, but one day the game makers try to flush people out with fire. We weren't hit that bad, but the flames push us to a part of the woods where we end up finding Katniss. By the looks of it, the fire hit her hard. We start chasing her in the entire town. I'm trying to figure out what to do. Like, do I turn on them now? Do I turn on them later? I just don't know. She climbs up a tree, thankfully, and none of us can follow her up. And I end up giving Glimmer the bow because she says you can, she can use it better than me, but she doesn't end up hitting a thing. I say we should forget about her until morning because she can't go anywhere when really, I'm trying to figure out what the fuck to do. I'm debating whether or not I should kill the rest of them in their sleep, but I won't be able to fight them all. And I don't know if I could bring myself to kill someone in their sleep. Katniss is probably confused and feels betrayed and hates me now, so that's also great. I still haven't really come to a decision when a tracker jacker hive suddenly descends upon us and four of us run sprinting to the nearest water source. I look around and see that Glimmer didn't come back and so I think, oh shit, the bow. So I start running back to where Katniss was and I see that Glimmer and another girl is dead. Katniss has the bow, but she's not moving. She looks dizzy. She looks really out of it. I say, what are you doing? You have to run, but she seems like she can't hear me. I can hear Kato coming up behind us. So I say, girl, fucking run, get out of here. So now it's official. I have to turn on the careers. Kato comes barreling out and I start to fight him when he slices me in the upper thigh. Then the world starts going to shit. I start hallucinating. I can't tell what's forward, what's backward. I can't even tell how I'm not dead yet. I guess Kato's probably tripping balls too. I end up at the bed of a stream and manage to cover myself and camouflage myself into the earth. I'm not sure how much time passes when I'm in this state. All I can do is eat a little bit, drink a little bit, but to be honest, I'm not even that hungry or thirsty and pray that Katniss's face doesn't show up in the sky. But thankfully, it doesn't. And one day, I hear a voice booming throughout the arena saying that two people from the same district can win the games together. Holy shit. I'm practically on my deathbed. And if Katniss even comes and manages to find me, she probably will abandon me anyway. I'm only going to be dead weight. But you know what? She actually does come for me and almost steps on my face when I say, you here to finish me off, sweetheart? Seeing her, hearing her voice, it's enough to make me keep wanting to live as long as I'm by her side. She suggests getting me to the stream so she can clean my wounds when I tell her to lean down for a sec. I say, I remember, we're supposed to be madly in love, so feel free to kiss me anytime you feel like it. I'm on the verge of death. A little flirtatious banter won't hurt anyone. Plus, I miss seeing her smile. She laughs and says she'll keep that in mind. She manages to get me into the stream and starts taking off my clothes and starts treating my wounds, but y'all, my leg is Bad. She's trying to treat me the best she can, but I can tell she doesn't have the medical knowledge to treat stuff like my leg. She tries putting these leaves on the wound to draw out the pus, and I can tell she's having a horrible time, so I mouth to her, how about that kiss to distract her? That sends her over the edge because she starts ranting about how she doesn't like pus and she doesn't know what the fuck she's doing. She's surprisingly squeamish for someone so lethal. I say I wish I let her give Hamish a shower after all. She asks me what he sent me so far, and I say, not a thing. Wait, hold up. Did she get something? And she said she got burn medicine and a whole loaf of bread. Bitch, I knew she was the favorite, but damn. That's good though. Obviously, I would want her to have those things over me. She ends up dragging me to this cave where we make our base for a little while. I'm feeling worse and worse, and all I can do is focus on her face as she's trying to disguise our little fortress, and I say, hey, Katniss, thank you for finding me. But if I don't make it, she says, don't talk like that. She didn't drain out all the pus for nothing. I say, I know, but just in case, and she says she doesn't even want to discuss it. And I'm like, we're gonna have to at this point. 
point. I also didn't expect her to have such a big reaction to the thought of me dying. Why does that bother her so much? I try to say something again, but she leans down and kisses me and says I won't die because she forbids it. Oh. Oh. I doze off, but Katniss wakes me to say that Hamish sent us some broth, and it takes a lot of convincing and kissing for me to finish the whole thing. Food and water and everything is just so repulsive, and I could tell. Also, Katniss is trying everything she can, but I'm really not getting better. The next morning, Katniss is actually gone, and I start pissing because I know Kato and Clove like to hunt at night. I'm in no condition to go out and find her, and I would be defenseless if anyone were to come and attack me right now, but she comes back and is seemingly amused at me getting all worked up over this. But no, thank God, she's all right. She's well. She's here with me. Now that the rules are changed, I don't have to resign myself to death. And now that the rules are changed, we can both go home together. Maybe that's why her feelings have changed. Maybe she realized she has feelings for me now, now that she doesn't have to see me as a competitor that she has to kill. I let Katniss sleep for a while. And let me just say, I get what my boy Edward was talking about. I could watch her sleep for eternity. It's peaceful and beautiful. It's distracting me from the fact that I'm gonna die real soon. I take a look at my leg and it's blood poisoning. Plain and simple. Katniss is saying how I'll just have to outlast the others and then we can go home together and I say sure, sure. I ask her to tell me the story of the happiest day that she remembers and she tells me about how she got Prim her goat. My envy suddenly hits me like a truck. Prim and Katniss are so lucky to have each other. Katniss loves her so much and took her place in the reaping practically without a second thought. I don't know how much time I have left. I hope I did enough to set Katniss on the path to victory. But if I somehow live, I want to pay her back tenfold for saving me. Suddenly a voice booms throughout the arena inviting us to a feast because each of us alive desperately needs something. The remaining people are me, Katniss, Kato, Thresh, and this girl that Katniss nicknamed Foxface. Their backpacks marked with everyone's district numbers at the cornucopia. Basically, it's going to be a bloodbath. I immediately turn to Katniss and say she can't go. She cannot die for me. I forbid it. She said of course she's not going, but if there's one thing that I've learned during my time with her, it's that she can't lie. She says, okay, she's going and I can't stop her. And I say, oh, you wanna bet? I will wholeheartedly die trying. I will drag myself after her, screaming as loud as I can until I die from blood blood loss or someone puts me out of my fucking misery. She says she can't sit here and watch me die and I say I won't. As long as you're here with me, I will not die. I promise. So Katniss starts feeding me and I've revoked my complaining privileges so I have to just gulp it down. She actually comes to bring me this new berry, a sugar berry, and she starts shoveling it into my mouth and I'm like, oh wow, this is really sweet. And it almost tastes like something familiar, something, something sweet, something too sweet. Like syrup, bitch. I try to spit it out or vomit or something, but she covers my nose and mouth and I slip into unconsciousness. She drugged me with sleep syrup. The audacity. When I wake up, Katniss is lying next to me in a pool of blood. I notice she successfully got the backpack and shot the medicine into my arm, but what's the point if she's fucking dead? Thankfully though, she's not dead upon closer examination. She has a wound on her forehead and I bandage it up the best I can. As I'm waiting for her to wake up, my anger has already faded away. I'm just tired of being a burden to her. When Katniss wakes up, she tells me how Thresh killed Clove and he didn't kill her because he was paying her back for how she treated Rue. She tells me that at one point her and Rue ended up forming a little alliance and they ended up destroying the career's food supply by activating the minefield and that caused her to lose hearing in her left ear and then Rue was killed by one of the District 1 people. I say I still can't believe he would give up killing her for that. She said I wouldn't understand and it's like how she can't seem to stop owing me for that bread thing that happened years ago. I say I think it's fucking fair to say the debt has been repaid considering she just brought me back from the dead. She asks me why I did it that day when I didn't even know her and I say, you know why, but she looks confused and then I remember how Hamish said it would need a lot of convincing. A storm comes so there's nothing else for me and Katniss to do except hope Kato and Thresh kill each other and also snuggle. It's weird. I don't think people are supposed to be this happy during the Hunger Games. I mean, sure, I'm severely traumatized from seeing and committing murder, but at least I got the girl and we can actually win this thing and live happily ever after. I mean, we can go back to District 12 and see both of our families again and live in the victor's village with Hamish. I mean, I could see the life that we have set before ourselves and I'm actually excited for once. I end up telling her the full story of how I came to have a crush on her. There's lots of kissing and we end up getting a feast from Hamish. Then the anthem starts playing and we see that Thresh is dead, meaning it's just us and Kato and Foxface left. Then the next day we get on the move to hunt, but apparently I'm so loud that I'm scaring off game within a 10 mile radius. So Katniss not so politely suggests that I go collect some twigs and berries 
berries while she goes off to hunt by herself. I'm doing a pretty good job if I say so myself when Katniss comes and almost shoots me in the head because she starts yelling at me about how we had this signal where I was supposed to whistle and she whistles back but I stopped whistling and that's the same thing that happened to Rue and when she came back Rue was dead and I was like girl I'm sorry but it's okay I'm not dead I promise. I was like I was just collecting these awesome new berries and she was like that's Nightlock you dipshit and then suddenly a can goes off and she twirls around and looks at me but I'm not dead and then not too far away we see Foxface's body being lifted up into a hovercraft. I accidentally poisoned her. Even though this brings us one step closer to winning I feel icky. It's not fair she died because I was stupid not because she was stupid. Now it's just us and Kato. Hopefully we could play the same Nightlock trick on him. There's no action for a little while until suddenly all of the water sources are drained except the one at the lake. All right motherfuckers let's end this thing. We go to the lake looking for a battle and we don't see Kato when suddenly he comes barreling towards us. Katniss shoots at him but there are a couple of surprises. Number one he has full body armor the arrow just bounces right off him. Number two is that he actually runs right past us and we think huh that's odd he's running away from something whatever could it be. We turn and look to see mutts. Yup a whole horde of mutts. Kato's headed to the cornucopia and we run barreling after him but the thing is my leg is shit. I can't run and so I'm just hobbling after them. They're leaving me in the dust but I barely managed to climb on top of the cornucopia with the two of them and Kato is so winded that he's not even an immediate threat. The mutts aren't very good climbers but they could still jump and grab us and Katniss screams when she realizes that they have the eyes of our fellow tributes. Sure that's just another unnecessary element of fuckery. Suddenly one mutt grabs me and starts pulling me down. Then just as suddenly I'm ripped away from Katniss and put into a headlock. I'm not really sure which situation to address first but right before I lose consciousness I manage to draw an X on Kato's wrist and Katniss immediately gets my signal. She shoots him. I fall out of the headlock and then push Kato to the ground so he's at the mercy of the pack. We thought they would kill him. We thought that that would be the end of it but they kept him alive and he probably died one of the most slow and painful deaths I've ever witnessed. The sounds of his cries are forever going to haunt me. I finally tell Katniss to finish him off with her last arrow and she does so we one. But there are no victory trumpets, no announcements, but suddenly there is one saying that the previous revision has been revoked. There can only be one winner of the Hunger Games. You know what? Why am I not fucking surprised? So I stand up and throw away my knife and look to see Katniss aiming the bow directly at my heart. She starts to lower it down in embarrassment, but I say, do it. She says she can't, but I say, I don't want to go out like Kato. Please shoot me now before something worse comes along. She says I should shoot her instead, and I almost laugh. Fine, if she's being stubborn, I'll just kill myself. I rip off the bandage that Katniss has tied so tightly around my leg and blood starts pouring. She says I can't leave her alone and I say Katniss, I love you. I've loved you for a while and my only goal when I entered this arena was to guarantee your safety and I did that. I don't know how I managed but I did. I see her start to fumble with the pouch holding the nightlock and I say no but she says trust me. Pour some into my hand she's holding some and she says on the count of three. On the count of three. We put our backs to each other and I tell her to hold out the berries because I want the capital to see this. In fact I want everyone to see. One, two, three motherfuckers. I put the berries in my mouth, but the trumpets start to blast. I immediately spit them out and Katniss does the same. We go to rinse our mouths as they're announcing that we just won the Hunger Games. A hovercraft comes to take us away, but as soon as I'm in there, I just lose consciousness. For a while, I'm dipping in and out of sleep, and when I wake up for good, I notice that I lost a portion of my leg, but hey, if Katniss didn't try and help me out, I wouldn't be alive at all. Portia comes to see me and tells me that Katniss is all right, but they want our reunion to be live during the ceremony. I'm taken to the stage and Katniss comes out and her beauty hits me like a fucking truck. She runs over to me and we hug and share a long kiss and uh, Caesar almost tries to interrupt us but I push him away. Eventually we make our way to the love seat and snuggle up real close while we watch the three hour recap of the most brutal thing of my entire life. I get to see her dodge the fireballs which led to our reunion, how she dropped the nest on us, how she blew up the career supplies, Rue's death, her singing. When they announced the rule that two people from the same district could win simultaneously she called out my name and it made my heart lurch. Apparently after we had won and the hovercraft was taking us away, they had to restrain her behind a door because she was banging on it and screaming my name while the doctors were working on me. President Snow himself comes to give us our crowns and then we head to the victory banquet. Me and Katniss stay holding hands as person after person comes up to us. I don't even get a chance to talk to her in private before Portia comes up to talk to me and Hamish escorts her to her room. The next time I see her is for our final interview. At least when we get home, we'll have some privacy. Caesar starts asking her when she knew she loved me and I was like, that's an excellent question. She said it was when she yelled my name after the the rule changed because she realized she could keep me. She didn't have to see me as a competitor. And I suspected as much, but it was nice to hear her say it. I say, so now that you've got me, what are you gonna do with me? Then Caesar starts talking about all our trials and tribulations and apparently she didn't know about my whole metal leg situation and feels really bad about it, which I don't even understand because I'm alive because of her. She has nothing to be sorry for. 
Then Caesar asks the final question. The moment she pulled out the berries, what was going through her mind? She says she doesn't know. She just couldn't bear the thought of being without me. And I say, that goes for me too. Glad we're on the same page. So we get on the train to go home. I can't believe this is actually happening. The thing is, on the train, Katniss has changed. It seems the closer we get to District 12, the more reserved she becomes. Then Hamish comes over praising us, saying to keep it up until the cameras are gone. And I'm like, what's he talking about? She says the Capitol didn't like our stunt with the berries. So Hamish has been coaching her so she didn't mess anything up. And I say, he's only been coaching you? She says, yeah, he knows you're smart enough to get it right. And I was like, I didn't know there was anything to get right. What are we talking about here? I say, wait, this whole star-crossed lovers act, it was just an act the whole time. She was acting during the games? She says not all of it was for the games. And I was like, well, how much? You know what? I guess it doesn't matter. I guess the real question is what'll happen when we get home. And she says, she doesn't know. This girl is a liar. God, I'm so stupid. I mean, I practically forced her into a position where she would have to lie even if she didn't have feelings for me. That was the narrative that we were trying to tell everybody, the crowd, the capital. I thought I would be able to tell when she was being genuine. I truly thought that every touch, every word, every kiss was real. I go to my room and straight up sob. I guess it was pretty foolish of me to set my sights on a future which was an illusion the entire time. Plus, I'm sure part of the reason that she's getting more uneasy as we get to the district is she probably has something with Gail that she needs to sort out. Plus, what does she mean not all of it was an act? Which parts were an act? Does she only care about me as a friend and she had to force herself to kiss me? Oh my god. I stay in my room the entire time and only when we're literally pulling up to the district do I get out to meet her. So I hold out my hand and say one more time for the cameras. And that's where we will end for today. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little show. Anyway, hope you had a good day y'all and I'll see you next time.